great opportunity for me to speak to medical students again. It's been many years since I had my little retinue of medical students and residents. Right after I finished my internal medicine residency, I was on the faculty at the University of Arizona College of Medicine and at the Tucson VA in the ambulatory care section. One of the reasons I became interested in political aspects is because I had this great horror of the prospect that the whole world would become like a giant VA with all of this bureaucracy. Um, the, yeah, this was like the first experiment. Yeah, you know, my job there, the job that I got paid for was being the gatekeeper for the VA. I was protecting the system against non-service connected veterans who came in wanting medical care. And we were not supposed to do anything for them unless they had a service connected disability. We were supposed to just get them out. Um, all of us did do something for them if we could. But I did something that was against the rules that was considered to be abusing the system. That if the patient had something and I was worried about him, and he didn't immediately need hospitalization, I would treat him and then I would say, come see me at 2.30 in two days. Like I would schedule a follow-up appointment with him as an individual to make sure he was okay. But you weren't supposed to do that because I wasn't the patient's doctor, I was the VA doctor. And I might have gotten fired for it, but I had a really splendid boss who was a Hippocratic physician. He was in it for the love of the patient and the love of the art, and was also extremely skilled at dealing with the VA bureaucrats. Well, after about four and a half to five years, I went into solo private practice, where I still am, and also had the wonderful opportunity to work as the editor of the first edition of The Art and Science of Bedside Diagnosis by Joseph Sotaira. It's now called Sapyrus Art and Science of Bedside Diagnosis, and I am the author of the fourth edition now. And this is a book about pre-revolutionary medicine. Dr. Sapyrus said the revolution occurred in 1968 when academic medicine changed from being about clinical examination to being about protocols and, and about technology. And it's the same way with AAPS. I've seen that the revolution is now making it things, instead of being about the patient-physician relationship, it's about relationships to the third party, which more often than not is the US government. And it's about population health, rather than about taking doing your best for the individual patient. So one of the things that I if that's in my book that I'd like to read a bit to you. If I can figure out how to use this um, new thing with Kindle contraption. <laughs> this, this is about the electronic medical record, it's about the medical record, which is really kind of the heart of medical practice and probably illustrates better than anything else the changes that are occurring in medicine today. I'm indebted to this for Dr. William Chalk never met Dr. Schaffman, he wrote a really brilliant article. And he, he wrote, the author of the medical record creates a legacy that may follow the patient for the rest of his life. The record is a literary work and a tool that's supposed to benefit the patient. Creating a good record is a difficult and time-consuming task. Physicians in primary care specialties can easily spend 10% of their professional life authoring patient records. Case histories are created, not taken. It's important to be complete, accurate, legible, and concise, and to organize the story in a logical manner. It's also essential to present the patient as a person worthy of respect. The example that he gave from his practice was, a second year medical student approached the patient with dread as she read the case note of an outgoing fourth year student. This is a difficult, non-compliant, 47-year-old alcoholic who comes to the clinic repeatedly for multiple somatic complaints. This student, new student set a goal for herself, finding out who this patient in this green note was. She allowed the patient to speak without interruption. Can you imagine that? She discovered that several preventive interventions were over to and negotiated a plan. And as the patient left, she told the student that no one else had really listened to her. 
After the visit, the student added several new problems to the problem list. Illiteracy, loneliness, grief, and poverty. And she added a narrative description to help keep future students and physicians from being poisoned by the record that her predecessors has created. Margaret Green is a pleasant 47-year-old woman. She was orphaned as a baby, raised in a series of foster homes, physically and mentally abused in many of the homes, until finally, at the age of 13, a woman took her in, who loved her and adopted her. What's your name? She um, did poorly in school because of, she was hard of hearing, finally dropping out because she could not keep up and people made fun of her. Uh, she was employed for 20 years cleaning buildings. But when she turned 40, her adopted mother died, her health deteriorated, and she quit working. Sounds like two different people, doesn't it? Well, how do you put the humanity of the patient into the electronic medical record? And how do you get a logical story out of it? This is kind of the difference between pre-revolutionary medicine and medicine today. For a more contemporary example, a colleague of mine was visiting in Chile, and her husband became very seriously sick and was hospitalized in Chile, and she was worried about what, how it's going to be in this third world country. Well, the technology they had was adequate, but something happened there that she was not used to seeing in American hospitals. Everyone who, who attended, her, attended her husband did an assessment, talked to the patient, examined the patient, from the respiratory therapist, the nurse, to the physician. Uh, my niece was going to nursing school, just finished her nursing degree, and told me one time, she observed me doing a very perfunctory examination on a friend of hers, just to fill out a bureaucratic form because they needed a physical exam. She said, you know, I've never seen the doctor do such a thorough exam, even on desperately sick patients in the intensive care unit. So far we come from clinical examinations, and so far we come from the humanity of the patients. When, when I went to medical school, which was a long time ago, one of the professors who had the biggest influence on me was, was one that I, for, at the beginning, had little respect for. He was old. Of course, people looked old, much older to me then than they do now. He was also the private physician at the famous clinic across the street. His patients came to the Harkis Pavilion in limousines, kind of looked down on the like that. I think it was part of his rent that he had to deal with medical students and he had to attend on patients on the wards at Columbia Presbyterian in New York. Um, but we thought, well, he's a rheumatologist. We're going to learn a lot about rheumatoid arthritis, and about basic science, and about all the, the findings of the, and the patients of you know, doing a really good rheumatologic exam. But he wasn't interested in any of those things. He demanded that we find out who the patient was and how this illness had affected her life. So while well, at first that didn't seem to be you know, a high-tech thing that we were in medical school to learn how to do, it's one of the things that we remember the longest. So what's going to happen in the future with medicine? I think that pre-revolutionary medicine is going to survive. I look upon myself as a small mammal. And I think that physicians, if we're allowed to continue to work, are going to outlast the dinosaurs, which are these massive, clunky, rigid, bureaucratic, fossilized healthcare delivery systems, managed care, and things like the VA. When they crash and burn, physicians will still be there to take care of our patients. So this is what AAPS is trying to promote and preserve the patient-physician relationship. I hope that you will take advantage of free membership in AAPS. Um, if you don't want to sign up and get our, our um, print publications, all of them are available online, at least go to aapsonline.org and sign up for our free email. And this will keep you aware of, of things that are going on. A new thing that we're going to start uh, it's tentatively scheduled for February 12th and 19th, Wednesday evening at 7.30, is a series of webinars on topics that we think we will be of interest and helpful to both students and practicing physicians. The first two are going to be about medical statistics. 
This is something that we may not, is not treated very well in medical school, but we really need to understand if you're going to evaluate evidence-based clinical medicine for yourself, and also if you're going to be able to evaluate all these social engineering nostrums that are being forced upon us um, by medical politics. Also, we're going to start some uh, Twitter chats. The first kind of dry run was, was hashtag SOTUMD, that's for the State of the Union address. And but I think the main thing we're going to emphasize in the future is how, how to have a patient-centered practice where you're dealing directly with the patient, how to have a viable, satisfying practice where you can sleep overnight and not fight with insurance companies all day long. So please go to um, follow us on Twitter at, at AAPS online. Jeremy is up and down the camera. He takes care of that one. And, and if you get on our email alert at aapsonline.org, we will invite you to all of these events so you can find out about them. If you would like to support the student chapter, we'd be glad to help you in any way that you can. We need to buy pizza and other things for lunch. And I am told that we are going to have lunch if somebody finally gets a thing they thought that um, the, the meeting was tomorrow rather than today. So you can write to us at APS at APSonline.org and we'd be glad to answer any questions or help you in any way that possible. Take a five minute break. Sure, five minutes. Hey guys, food's here. Come on out and help yourselves, please.